Welcome to the next installment of Finance 201. This issue, we're talking about reinvesting capital into your business and assets. One of the reasons it's so difficult to manage a funeral home is it has both a large capital investment and a fixed overhead between 26 and 32% of all revenue to go to pay for its specialized labor force. The only other enterprise that has similar characteristics is a hospital. And you know how difficult it must be for someone to run a hospital. For this issue, I spoke to two different groups of owners of funeral homes. I spoke to Bill and Matt Schichtel, father and son, the owners of the Heath Funeral Chapel and Crematory in Lakeland, Florida. Bill and his son, Matt, are the second and third generations, respectively. Early in his ownership, Bill and the business founder, Foster Heath, had to make a decision. Do we build a new separate funeral home? Or do we add on to the existing business with a cremation and reception center? I also spoke to Diane and Stephen Anderson, owners of the Anderson Funeral Home in Belvedere, Illinois. This business traces its roots back to the 1890s. Diane and Steve were blessed with a funeral home where the building was originally a residence. Their conundrum was how to rebuild this facility so that it provides the quality and character of its 90 year history and provides the operational support for today's needs and the needs of the family as they use their care home. Every business has capital assets that need to be replaced, reused, refurbished, and rehabilitated. Funeral homes are no different. Furniture, fixtures, other decor items, automobiles, computers, and more all have to be replaced. They wear out. But when the building itself has to be dealt with, that becomes a risky proposition. Funeral homes are not mobile businesses. You can't just pick them up and relocate them easily. Oftentimes, you're reinventing the building and the property. And the risk is the cost. The cost is large. Are you aware that it could cost anywhere from $200 to $300 per square foot? That means a 5,000 square foot building could cost anywhere from a million dollars to $1.5 million just for the building. In the event you're adding a cremation center, You've got $200,000 of equipment, maybe some unique structural changes, and you have all this expense. And unless you're bringing in new cases or saving the money on using third-party crematories, there is no added value to the bottom line. In my career, I've seen a few bankruptcies 
or complete business failures. And most have centered around the debt being taken on to rebuild a funeral building. That risk can be complicated by the age of the owners. How many years until they're ready to retire? Can they get the ROI, the return on investment that they need during that window of time? Today, in 2021, interest rates are low. They're as low as they've been in 85 years. But even low interest rates do not eliminate risk. So please, read my article in the NFTA Director Magazine and watch my interview and closing comments with Diane, Stephen, Matt, and Bill. In May of 1959, Foster Heath and his wife Doris pursued their dream of creating a funeral home in Lakeland, Florida. The couple officially opened Heath Funeral Chapel in November of 1959. In the late 1980s, Foster was deciding upon the next owner of the business and his daughter Caroline and her husband Bill decided to relocate their young family to be the next generation. Bill, as a second career, got licensed and joined his father-in-law, ultimately succeeding him. Bill and Foster decided to expand the business to include a reception area and a cremation center, rather than building a second location. In 2011, Caroline and Bill's son, Matt, came into the business as the third generation. After a career of more than 50 years, Foster, a World War II veteran and a POW, died in 2012. Matt and Bill huddled around their one video camera to talk with me about the decision to build the reception and cremation center and how that decision turned out. Bill and Matt, welcome to Finance 201. Thanks for having us, Dan. Thanks, Dan. We're happy to be here. So you guys uh, are in the business, uh, second generation and third generation, respectively. Uh, and a couple of years ago, Bill, uh, before Matt came into the business, you made a decision to want to add to the physical plant by adding a reception area. Tell me a little bit about what went into that thought process. Okay, well, Foster Heath and myself were talking about actually first about actually building another funeral home in Lakeland. And uh, the thought came up that we maybe we had visited, actually we visited Anderson McQueen funeral home maybe, maybe about a month or two before. And we had visited their tribute center in St. Petersburg. And Foster and myself were very impressed with their facility that they could have receptions either during a visitation or after a service for all their families. And we thought that's something that would be nice that we could offer our families in Lakeland. And uh, actually we started our building in 2008 that we had, we had worked on the design for almost two years for this. Foster and myself designed it and uh, it worked out very well for us. Approximately how many square feet is the additional building? And of that, uh, how, do you, how did you divvy that square footage up between the reception area, kitchen, bathrooms, uh, et cetera? Well, we had an architect. Uh, there was an architect, Dan Fowler, who uh, is a good friend of ours in Lakeland, and I walk with him three days a week. And he ended up being the architect for the facility, and he was working with us. And I would, we would talk about it every time we would walk and tweak it and do things. But the actual square footage of the whole building is 5,000 square feet. 
uh, 4,000 with the tribute center part, and we added 1,000 square feet with a new crematory. So the crematory, is it uh, a, uh, a, a facility whereby you can have witnessed cremations, or is it just a, a, a professional area? Yes, you can witness the cremation. We have a window where people can look through and actually identify a loved one in a safe environment, or they can actually witness a cremation actually taking, taking place. Matt, I'm curious, how do families use the viewing area between uh, viewing and identifying the, the loved one as well as uh, witnessing the cremation? Well, um... Most use it to um, identify their loved ones before commission takes place. Um, uh, before COVID, we would actually have it mandatory for, a, if the family was not present when we actually made the transfer to our funeral home from the place of death, that they would need to be able to identify their loved one uh, to make sure that we were correctly cremating the correct person. Um, we also have the option to witness cremations and that option is usually ch chosen by our Buddhist and Hindu community in Lakeland, where uh, witnessing the cremation starting and having the eldest son start the cremation is a very, very big part of their uh, traditions and religion. That's fabulous uh, use of the property and, and, and the uh, professional practice note on having the uh, mandatory identification. Uh, because too often, uh, in, if a body gets switched by accident, uh, we wind up having an invalid cremation. How long did it take you to build the 5,000 square foot facility? Started, I believe it was uh, around November of 2007. And we actually opened the, our facility, I think it was late August of 2008. And was financing a difficult part of the process? Well, we were very fortunate because uh, Foster had savings. And back in 2007 is when the market crashed. And this is probably top secret information, but Foster took the money out of all of his investments to pay for this. I'd say a month before the market crashed and we put it in a safe spot to pay for that building and all everything we put in it. And it was just like, he could read the future and it was it worked out perfect for those of you outside of the area of, of florida that maybe never had a chance to meet bill's father-in-law uh foster heath a, a remarkable man an incredible life uh life story uh a um, gunner in world war ii uh shot down pow and survived uh, and, and an amazing outlook on life. Uh, so it, it, when you tell me it, it might have been a, a lucky move, uh, great to see that he had luck remaining after all that he had gone through. He worked three funerals the, the day before he died. He was 92 years old. And probably two months before he died, he, he would he'll always say when he walked in, he says, Bill, I still love coming into work every day at 92 years old. An amazing man. Bill, this issue is dedicated to the concept of capital investments. Uh, this was an expensive capital investment that uh, you uh, uh, began and Foster funded. Uh, were there any changes that you would have done differently now that you look uh, a little more than a decade later? Not a lot of changes. Uh, a lot of the things we did, we, we, we thought about this for a good two years plus before we built the building. Uh, some of the things that we thought of ahead of time is with the crematory is eight inches wider than the normal crematory. Because when I was sleeping one night, I was, I was thinking, what if we have a person that we can't fit in our crematory? So I'm thinking we, now is the time to design it so it's bigger so we can accommodate a bigger person. And that worked out good for us. Uh, some of the things that we did that we would not have done again is I never, we never would have used wood on the outside tr for the, the wood paneling on the outside of the building because the wood only lasted a couple of years and it rotted. Uh, so we replaced it all since with hardy board, which is a, a cement based material that'll last forever. 
Another thing we would not have done before is uh, we had elect automatic sinks and toilets. And those have a tendency to not work at the, at the perfectly wrong time. So slowly but surely, we replaced them all with manual to avoid future problems with the toilets and sinks. Now, Matt, as the next generation, are there any capital investments that you perceive you need to make in order to keep this business as progressive as possible? The, the biggest would probably be the audio visual uh, video system. Um, uh, we we kind of tweaked it about five years ago, but it's been about 10 to 12 years since we've put the, the main pieces in. And with the advances in technology and as well as the uh, need now to be able to uh, webcast and live stream uh, funerals and visitations, uh, we more than likely probably, probably, probably be, need, be needing to make adjustments and other capital uh, capital investments to the building to be able to make those uh, additional changes. From 2008 to 2021, uh, did the capital improvements enhance your standing uh, for market share? I feel it definitely has. Uh, by building that facility, it was like having another funeral home. And, and we were able to accommodate more families uh, and actually be, having them be able to have a reception and a service at one location where I think a lot of families may have chosen us for that reason. How do you find most families are using the reception part of, of that new building? Are they catering a reception or are they uh, self-catering, potluck? What, what are they doing to uh, make the reception special? Well, with uh, potluck, we actually don't allow uh, families to bring in their own food just with liability of food poisoning and insurance concerns. Uh, so we actually have our own caterer. Uh, we have our menu where they can choose either a simple, you know, like a cookie, cookie and cheese package where you have an assortment of cheese and crackers and cookies uh, to more elaborate um, hors d'oeuvres or sit down meals. And then we also have, so have our beer and wine license for some families that wish to have beer and wine at their uh, receptions or visitations. So have you gotten any negative reaction to the uh, use of alcohol in a reception? Uh, no. Um, I mean, if the families don't want it, they, they, don't, they don't choose that option. Uh, but a lot of the times when the families that, that want it really want that option there just because, you know, that helps uh, put people at ease or it's just when they think of serving food, they think of needing to have beer or wine being served with the food. Uh, so we haven't really had any, any negative reactions at all um, to having beer or wine with a reception. And what percentage of families are coming back to the funeral home specifically for uh, what, what the Jews would call a shiva uh, or, or a catered event? Um, we have not actually run those numbers, but uh, just to give you a kind of a ballpark, I would, have, I would imagine it's probably 90% um, come back. Wow. Or, or use this for other family members. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Are you finding any ways that you're using that facility beyond uh, the funeral reception? Are you having any meetings, any community events or other things uh, taking place? Our Rotary Club, we have meetings in there once a year, usually uh, during the summer when the, there's not as many members that are coming because the people are on vacation. But our club is probably over 200 members now. And we can probably fit about 130 or 140 in there uh, during the summer when it's not as much attendance, but it's worked well for that. Uh, we also have um, our aftercare events there. Um, it's called Hope and Healing, but it's where we have uh, small kind of small classes where we have uh, like a, a grief counselor come in. Uh, she doesn't do therapy sessions there, but she gives more lectures and um, seminars on how to handle the grieving process after you lose someone. Um, we also have our annual kind of uh, service of remembrance event where we kind of honor uh, the loved ones that have passed in the past year. Uh, and then we, uh, we also use the room for arrangements 
um, uh, and other other kind of more funeral related items such as that. And when Foster turned 90 years old, we had his 90th birthday party there. And we asked a lot of the families afterwards what they thought about coming to our birthday party at the funeral home. And they said they were so excited to come. They wanted to, they, 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 they really enjoyed coming to the funeral home for another reason besides a funeral for a change. What else have you had to do with that building to make sure that it can perform when it needs to? Last year, we added a generator to be able to actually run the full tribute center and the crematory if we have a power outage. Because the last hurricane that we had two years ago, we lost power for over a week. You made reference to Anderson McQueen being one of the uh, thought centers for you as you were building your tribute center. I know John uh, and Nikki would train their staff to always go through the funeral home as they brought families into the arrangement conference area, uh, including giving them some coffee and they showed them the reception area. Uh, have you guys done anything like that? Yes, we try to give all of our families a tour of our facility, including the Tribute Center. And uh, a lot of times when we take them through the Tribute Center, we have never had a family refuse or not want to have a reception there. Once they had a, a chance to see it, they were very impressed. Now, I, I've been on your site, uh, and, and the Tribute Center is in the back area of the building. Uh, if your front door is on the north side, the, the Tribute Center would be on the south side. Uh, do you find it inconvenient to walk them uh, the extra 20 or 30 feet out of the way? Uh, no, uh, just because it's kind of, we, 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 we give the families a tour of the whole funeral home and most families want to be able to see their options. Uh, if, you get, if, you, if you go to uh, another business, you know, you wanna know all your options and I feel like the funeral business shouldn't be any different. Uh, and typically you're, you're, you're sharing knowledge at the same time that you're giving the tour. So it's, it doesn't seem to be an inconvenience to the family. Uh, we also made sure that the tribute center didn't have any uh, steps. So, you know, anyone that's handicapped uh, doesn't have any issues, you know, going, going between the buildings that, you know, it's just an easy path that they can, they can take. Uh, so we haven't had any issues with that at all. Bill and Matt, I want to thank you very much for being part of Finance 201. Thank you, Dan. We enjoyed helping you with you. Thanks for having us. are Diane and Steve Anderson from Belvedere, Illinois, where they own a funeral home uh, just outside of Rockford, Illinois. Steve and Diane, welcome to Finance 201. Good morning. Good morning. Steve, when you took over the business, one of the assets you acquired was the building and it was an older building, which has given you some planning opportunities. Uh, what are some of the issues with taking over a business with an older building and how have you had to deal with it? Well, yes, our building uh, was a, a home. It was um, constructed in 1904 and over the you know, almost 100 years, uh, when I came as an into ownership, there have been, uh, you know, two significant additions. And the, the quality of those additions, you know, <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And some of what's, you know, behind the scenes is a little, a little difficult as you try to work around um, what was 
good in the 60s and in the 90s and how does that how is it um, applicable to you know our time frame and, and going back and trying to repair some of that is um, very costly so over the course of time as part of this project you slowly and meticulously had to acquire adjacent pieces of real estate and now you're starting to um, move the facility uh, or the expansion into some of that area. Yes, when when we when it became apparent that we really needed to augment one um, from a preparation uh, and a holding facility. Currently, it's we have an old rope pull elevator. It would be a great museum piece at some point in time. Uh, but the problem is when you, when you have an issue with it, it's hard to get somebody to come and work on it. And our, our funeral home's in the middle of a residential area, uh, in all the established residential area, and there was nothing around us for sale. Um, and the, the thought of having to do this at some distance off-site, um, I could see that there could be some potential pitfalls with that and, and staffing and getting people to and from. So through a lot of prayer, uh, all of a sudden the, the piece of property right behind us uh, became for sale. Um, and, and then the one next to us, and then Diane would, happened to be um, out one morning and the lady was putting out some, some garden, you know, household stuff. Apparently there was a, a divorce and she was moving out and, and, uh, and said that, you know, you know the ex-husband was going to be willing to sell that property. So it just, all of a sudden it started to open up um, and we started to acquire. We made some, some mistakes early on. It's been a, you know, a, probably have like a PhD now in life experience going through this. Uh, certainly, the, the, the tuition has not been uh, inexpensive, should we say, but, uh, uh, but we you know, have been fortunate to be able to acquire the surrounding pro pieces of property and, uh, and really to enhance the neighborhood. Um, not only will we be able to enhance service to families, but also to beautify the area that we uh, occupy. Yeah, we've, been yeah it's, we've been working on it for five years and it has been, uh, I would say, a difficult process to say the least. Um, we started out like seven years ago renovating the interior of our funeral home and um, took great care to try to restore it back to its original integrity. And um, because of its age, it was not inexpensive to do that. We had to have five panel doors custom made in Chicago and um, it, it just it, it was a project that it, it just kept growing um, and we weren't trying to do something that was ostentatious or anything but we wanted it to be a um, warm homey um, experience for people and I, I think that we've achieved that and that's what we want to do carry on with this new facility too. Tell me about the new facility what what are some of the uh, components of the new facility that you're trying to create? That's been, you know, an evolving process as well because we've um, we've been, you know, just a brand new funeral home with a reception center and um, ceremonial space and cremation space and and then um, uh, then. Then we thought, well, we need to have those items, but maybe we can, you know, have it arranged in such a way that it's not as um, funereal. We wanted to have something that was kind of out of the box that uh, would appeal to the uh, people of the younger generations, as well as, you know, honoring the people that have more of a traditional mindset. And so we've there was a lot of different design processes that we um, had worked on. Of course, now the thing to remember too, every time you talk with an architect and you change the design, the meter starts over again. 
right? So part of that education and tuition I was talking about. How has COVID changed your planning? When COVID hit, and there was a, a change in the way that, um, you know, some preconceived ideas of, you know, we can't have a funeral, which was not true, uh, to how do you handle, you know, limited number of people and, and still have an experience that is meaningful. And so the, we made the decision that we would um, condense what we were going to build to, one, provide for the things that we know we definitely need to have for the future. And that is, you know, a state-of-the-art uh, preparation facility, a, um, a holding area. I, I term it a, a climate control room, but it's, you know, a cooler, a walk-in cooler that is secure. Describe the cremation center. Human cremation, and then, again, here's the, we might as well, you know, have a little more space and be able to put in a uh, retort for, for animal, um, for pet cremations. So our cremation facility, um, others more astute have used the term R&D, rip off and duplicate. And there are, there are many people um, that we have great admiration and respect for. And as they've explained some of their process of, processes it, it created you know turned on that that creative switch in Diane's mind to say you know here's here's what we could do differently and how it can be more impactful and um, so a, a space for that private family farewell so to speak we we'll also have an area that is a like a pergola it'll be heated um, it's a great area for the culmination of a service that's going to you know, end with cremation or to enhance um, a memorial service. And then to be able to take the family privately with their loved one over to the cremation facility for just some last private moments before the cremation takes place. If they want to witness, they can. If they want to assist in that, they can. How does the building complement the service. I think as human beings too, that we are hardwired within our souls to have ceremony. We, we are ceremonial human beings. We have birthdays, we have anniversaries, we have weddings, um, graduations. We have things throughout life that we celebrate. So to have a funeral without a ceremony, um, it's just not, it's not part of our DNA. It's not the way we're wired. And I think um, we've experienced, we, we do a ceremony even for our direct cremation families. We schedule a time for the, we call it a transferring service. And they come to the funeral home and we encourage them to bring whomever they want to bring, as many as they want to bring. And we do a, a small service in our chapel. And then we, you know, give them the time afterwards if they want to stay and have quiet time, um, whatever they want to do. And our families have really embraced that and have found great meaning in that. And part of this new cremation center, I even envision that the um, family room that Steve was describing would actually be a committal area where it would maybe not even just be the immediate family where even the attendees could follow in too, just like you would at a, a cemetery and you would have the committal there. Um, you know, we don't know what the future looks like now because of COVID things were changing rapidly and all of a sudden it just went into warp speed and it's changed overnight. So we don't have a crystal ball to know like what it's gonna look like a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Um, so we're trying to, make the best decisions we can to move into the future the best that we can to serve our families, but it's not easier. That's why we've had such a high tuition, as Steve calls it, with our planning, because we would go to conferences and seminars and we would hear presentations. And then, and you'd also talk to other funeral home owners who were doing these magnificent 
build outs and projects and you come back and you think, oh my gosh, we've got to do that. Diane, what are some of the development uh, and soft touches that you thought were important to bring into the new uh, construction and facility points? Well, whenever I design anything, I think about what kind of an experience I would want to have and what, I, what would make me, uh, how would I interpret the experience? So I would, I wanted to have a soft, homey feel in the new facility, just like we do in our uh, funeral home. And I wanted to be able to open up the retort area fully into the family room so that we could have uh, accommodation in the family room, just as you would if you were in a cemetery. And to be able to proceed from the funeral home into this new facility and include anyone that's at the funeral if they want to join in and, and uh, be a part of that. Were colors an issue in your design? Colors are always an issue when you're designing uh, the environment because uh, you want the color to be appropriate for the setting. And I've done a lot of research with colors that are appropriate for people who are grieving. And again, you want to you want it to be a soothing atmosphere. You want it to um, complement. It's you know, there's a lot to it. There's there's everything that goes in from lighting to color to um, fabrics to sound, everything. Was there a particular resource that you relied upon? to give you that education or is it more intuition? It's more intuition. I love to design and I'm always looking at how's H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z. Uh, there's a whole lot, there's a lot of things you can look at on that website. My guests today have been Steve and Diane Anderson. Thank you for being with Finance 201. It's great to be with you, Dan. Dan, it's, been, it's always a pleasure to be with you. So what did we learn? We learned that Matt and Bill are successfully increasing their market share with the help of their specialized reception center. We've learned that Stephen and Diane have worked to beautify their neighborhood rebuilding their footprint of their business. Thanks for watching Finance 201. Thanks for reading. And most importantly, thanks for being willing to learn.